would teach us and instruct us. And just an amazing thing, Lord, just your word written some 2,700 years ago that is still relevant for our day. And so, Lord, once again, reveal yourself to us that you would bless us and prepare us for every good work we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn and greet your neighbor. Neighbors. We're in Isaiah chapter 40. We'll be picking up after an introduction at verse 12, but I'll go back through the first part of the chapter, and then we'll get into our study tonight. A couple of weeks ago, we saw how Jerusalem had been delivered from a formidable foe in Assyria. Assyria, again, was like the ISIS of our day. They were running roughshod over the area. They were in capturing towns and people. They were murdering and so on and so forth. They were a very brutal people. Things just don't change. Things so remain the same, unfortunately. Then there was the king of Judah. There was King Hezekiah. We saw that he had been delivered from death. And again, all these things, Jerusalem delivered, the king delivered, all because God is merciful. All because God has a plan and and God is working things out. And again, you just look at the, the worldwide situation And it could cause your heart to fall into despair. But the thing about it is we know that God has a plan. And all things work together for the good. And there are these things, these promises that we have in the scriptures. And we need to cling to because there comes that day of hardship. Go ahead and turn over to Romans. I use these scriptures a lot in funerals because I just think that they just speak volumes. Romans chapter 8, just before we get into our, our study. I had an opportunity yesterday to go and and share and to minister to a man who I've become very fond of. I know, I don't know him real well, but he's just been in the work of ministry. He's retired and uh, he attends our church. He hasn't been able to come hardly at all within the last couple of years. Uh, Alan Jones is his name. Uh, Joanne, who who leads worship, Paul and Joanne, is Joanne's father. And he's more than likely near death. It's been on the prayer chain. Um, I went to visit him yesterday. He was very weak. He could hardly talk. and He was still coherent and all. And went in there, and his wife was there, Joanne and Paul and my wife, and I don't remember if anybody else was there. And I just asked him to leave. I just asked if they would leave and just leave us together. And there's just kind of this dynamic. Of, you know, and I've, I've done that before with others, especially, you know, and I want to confirm salvation in somebody's life. And it's just, you know, it's a very personal thing. And so I, I, I've done it before, and, and you know, I'll, I'll give, make sure that somebody has received Jesus or at least given the opportunity to receive the Lord. But this man has already received the Lord. There's just been no doubt in my mind. And it was just kind of a neat time. Now, we didn't get into any discussions because he couldn't really get into any discussions. But just to be there in the room with this man, he, he, he said he's ready to go home and, and, and be with the Lord and... And just to be there during at least the beginning, this advent of this most intimate time, intimate time between a believer and his God as God is preparing to take him home. And the scripture that I read, and you just I asked him to meditate upon it as he was laying on his bed, is in Romans chapter 8, verse 37 through 39. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And I anointed him with oil, and I prayed with him, and he just says, yeah, that, that's one of mine. And again, it was hard for, you know, I can't hear anyway, but it was hard for me to hear him because his voice was so drawn and whatever. And he was just stating how that's just one of his favorite chapters because some of the promises that are there and how we can know that even what he's experiencing is working together for the good. He brought up verse 18. He couldn't quote it, but he knew where it was. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And he says, he says and the chapter starts off real good. Yeah, chapter 8, verse 1. 
There is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ. And again, just in this one chapter, you just have such richness. But the richness, as you look at these things, it, it can be put in so many different areas of our lives, so many times of trials and tribulations, that if we truly cling to these things, you thwart the attacks of the devil and even the doubt that could rest in your own mind. When the devil tells you how bad you are, how contrary to God you are, yeah, there's therefore, though, no condemnation for those who are in Christ. When you got these things going on around you that you don't understand, you can have a surety that all things are working together for the good. When you enter into some kind of trial or tribulation, the one thing that you're able to cling to is that nothing can separate me from the love that God has for me. And even in the past of a loved one, verse 18, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And again, there's just richness that is there. And, and so you know, I invited everybody else back in, and we spent some time, and then I went in to say goodbye. We, I talked to some people outside. We went in, said goodbye, and I go, is there anything else I could do for you? And he says, you've already done it. And so it's, it, it's a hard aspect of, of the ministry that, that I have doing that, but it's also a blessing in part of that, just to see the richness of somebody's faith. And so here we are back in Isaiah chapter 40. There was Assyria knocking at the door, but God delivered Judah. Their king, it looked like he was going to die, but again, God delivered him because God is merciful. Matter of fact, we even understand his grace. Titus chapter 3, verse 5, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Now the prophet Isaiah takes some time to consider all that God has done. Something that we would do well to, to make a regular part of our Christian lives because we can so get caught up in processes and, and so on and so forth of the different things that are going on in your days, those routines and whatnot. And even if you're going to all the services Thursday night, small groups and Sundays and all of these things, just take some time to consider all that God has done. And I just look at all that God has done. I was even thinking that as I'm thinking about this study on the way over here, all that God has done in my life. And it's just kind of an amazing thing that God is mindful of me, that God is mindful of us. And we can't look past that. You need to consider it, meditate it, dwell upon it, and you need to embrace it, that God thinks upon you, and he's mindful of your situations and circumstances. When looking at what God has done, Isaiah is also reminded of what God is going to do, looking at what God is going to do in the future. We saw in the first part of this chapter, basically in verses 1 through 11, a psalm of praise, a psalm that the, 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 uh, the prophet broke out in when considering God once more. And the first thing that we saw, they were, it was broken up into four parts, these voices or words from God, and the message of the first voice was comfort. Comfort, yes, comfort, my people, says your God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her. So in the midst of trial, and even the deliverance of trial, because they could be of the mindset, what if Assyria turns around, comes back? What if Jeremiah, I'm sorry, um, the king, Hezekiah, what if Hezekiah does die? And, but no, God is there so that they can have comfort, that we can have comfort, and we can have peace regardless of the situations and circumstances of our life. So in the midst of all that occurs in the world, the only true and lasting source of comfort, because a lot of things are there, but they're band-aids, they're temporary, but we have 2 Corinthians 1, 3-4, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in our tribulation that we may be able to comfort those who are in any uh, trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. We saw four things that the comfort of God is based upon. It's based upon our relationship with Him, and that's key. This is a relationship. This is a two-way relationship between us and God that was fostered at the cross of Christ. It's that which we celebrated this morning at the communion meal so that we would not forget that God sought me. Not only did God seek after me, God pursued me. And if you're a born-again believer, you should be able to look at that and look back and you should see the earmarks of the pursuit of God in your life. I can look back in my life and I can see it clear as day from this perspective. Didn't really see it or understand it from the perspective before I was saved. But I saw how God was constantly doing a work, that all of those things were working together for the good, the greater good of the day of my salvation. 
and how it continues to work for the day of other salvation through my life. And I'm talking about just through the everyday life and the things that we do. And so God, he offers me comfort because of our relationship to such a degree that we would be called his children of adoption, precious, accepted, forgiven, worthy, co-heir, a temple, part of his body, a saint, a project, a citizen of heaven and chosen. Also, he gives us comfort. It's his response. His response, he has chosen not to keep his affections towards us a secret, but reveals them openly. Because I know I sit under the affections of God, I can find comfort in this life. His results, well, in our lives, we have been pardoned and we have emerged victorious. And then lastly, we saw the release of guilt. I no longer have to walk around with a cloud of guilt over my head. Again, the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 7, the things I want to do, I don't do, and so on and so forth, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. If you're in Christ, there's no condemnation. You're released of any guilt. The second message of the second voice was promise, speaking of, well, there was this messianic prophecy, verse 3, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. And we understood that spoke of the promise of a coming king. Thirdly, we saw the message of the third voice is the permanence of God's word. In verse 8, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God endures forever. And as the word of God endures forever, the promises of God endures forever. As the promises of God endures forever, God's ministry to you endures forever. And really what this chapter is shaping up as is very personal. God's very poignant towards you today, towards the hearer of this message today. I know it is towards me as well. And then fourthly, the last voice, it's just basically a description of our God of all comfort. Look at verse 11. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. And so the midst of your trial, he is your protector. Again, David in that well-known psalm, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. Now, if I ever get the chance to talk to King David in heaven, I'm going to tell him he was wrong. He's my shepherd. And then I got something to say to the Apostle John. I'm the one that Jesus loves. And you should all think that as well. Because, again, it's about relationship. We have a very personal God. Now what the prophet does in, cons in considering all of these things and that ministry, all that God has fostered and the deliverance of the nation, and, and again, just the, the magnitude of who God is, he considers the superiority of God. The superiority of God and just looking how God is just so much greater than, well, really, than everything. Kind of a simplistic statement, but it carries a lot of weight when consider it biblic considering it Biblically, our God of the Bible is superior to anything else that mankind might be prone to worship, to trust in, or to seek after, especially in times of trouble. Again, think of that. Think of the world. What do they have in times of trouble? What do they have in moments of despair that they're able to draw comfort from or peace from or whatever it might be? Because you look out what's there that, that I might be able to find, and, and really it's of equal level with me, another, I'm talking in an unsafe state, another person or a lower level than me. Alcohol, drugs, whatever it might be, whatever it is that the world seeks uh, deliverance from during a time of trouble. But we have that which is so much greater in our days of need and then the sorrow that sin can bring. I have my God who is exceedingly abundantly above all that I can ever ask for or think. Remember, as Judah was delivered by our God, who is Yahweh, the event was documented, documented in God's permanent word so that we could reference it. That during your time of trouble, that you could remember it. And lastly, that you could also rely upon it. Just as truly as there is Jerusalem, it's surrounded by the Assyrian army. Now again, this was a, a force that was overwhelming of the day. They were as good as dead, but God intervened and God delivered. 
And then there's Hezekiah. He's on his deathbed. It, there was no doubt this man was dying, but God intervened. You are a sinner. You are headed to judgment, but God intervened. It's the same God that can intervene in your life tonight. It's the same God that can intervene in your life tomorrow. It's the same God that can intervene in your life at any moment. You need to recognize this God. You need to glorify this God, and you need to seek this God. And again, what I'm talking about is just a fresh awareness of who he is. I mean, I know most of you know who he is, and I understand that. You understand the magnitude. But don't get caught up again in routine. Be open to that fresh awareness. Be open to a new movement of the Spirit in your life. Be open to a reintroduction to God to a higher degree than even that you had before. That's really the true meat of the word. Again, combining studies from this morning tonight. There was the Apostle Paul, and the Apostle Paul and he probably knew through the Spirit that he was going to be seeing the elders of the church in the region of Ephesus for the last time. And in Acts chapter 20, I just added, it's not going to be on the screen, verse 32, it says, For now, brethren... I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance amongst all those who are sanctified. Paul knew he wasn't able to provide those things. He's saying, I'm directing you where you need to go. As Paul is decreasing, he wants to make sure that God increases in their lives. And that needs to be the end result of all of our ministries, is for us to be decreasing, and for God to be increasing in their lives. If there's anything that I could desire that I would leave with my children and my grandchildren, it would be that, that I would decrease in their lives and God would increase in their lives. Because at some point, y'all are going to read in the newspaper, Pastor Mike died, assuming the rapture didn't come, because sooner or later, that's going to happen. It's a reality. And when Pastor Mike's no longer here, if it was Pastor Mike that anybody was dependent upon, they're going to be in trouble. But our God will never leave us, nor will he forsake us. So Isaiah's examination of the greatness of God in the midst of it all, he comes to six conclusions. Six conclusions. And now, I, I don't know exactly the background on chapter 40 as far as what Isaiah was specifically doing. But here it sure looks like he's just meditating upon God. He's focusing upon God through God's word and understanding the reality of who God is. And the first conclusion he comes to is in verses 12 through 14 when he realizes God is greater than all creation. Verse 12, Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, measured heaven with a span, and calculated the dust of the earth in a measure? Weighted the mountains and scales and the hills in a balance. Who has directed the spirit of the Lord, or as his counselor has taught him? With whom did he take counsel, and who instructed him and taught him in the path of justice? Who taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? I've used the example here before, but just looking at your hand. Look at all that a person accomplishes in a lifetime. Look at all that you have set your mind to do and your hands to accomplish. And, and again, look at it throughout a life. It, it, without a doubt, it pales in comparison to God. Now, it's a natural phenomena, a God-orchestrated one, but nonetheless a natural phenomena that no one can create anything that is superior to himself. Now, I can build a machine that is stronger than me, but it's not going to be able to stand alone and survive without me, somebody to maintain it and whatnot. I'm talking about the total package. I cannot create, and nobody can, a being that is greater than them. That's something that even God can't do. If God is perfect, how could he possibly make somebody greater than him? Yes, there's certain things that God can't do. God can't lie, the scripture tells us. God can't sin, and God can't create a superior being to him. This being the case, as you meditate upon creation, as you look and consider the vastness of outer space or the depths of the ocean, the heights of the mountains, the intricacies of a living being, the cellular structure and all, the detail of microorganisms and the beauty of a musical note, consider how much greater God is in these things because God created them all. 
God created them all. And, and as God cannot create something that is superior to them, then ergo, he is greater than, than all of those things. And again, just, just this little view as we consider these things, and, and you see how much greater God is, it just shows you who he is and the power of his might and his ability. And then on top of all of that, you consider that he spoke all these things into existence. I'm sorry, I have yet to learn to tie my shoe properly. <laughs> I'm going to teach you about God, but I can't tie my shoe. He spoke everything into existence. See, the seat of creation from which everything exists. Romans chapter 1, verse 20, it says, Since the creation of the world, this happened right in Genesis chapter 1, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. And so when somebody's concerned about the proverbial native in the backwoods of wherever they may have been, and what about their salvation? Creation. Creation speaks of the existence of God. Man will be held accountable based upon the information given to him. There's two ways that we know of the existence of God. We know the existence of God through the Word of God and through creation. And in actuality, it's creation that leads us to the Word of God so that we would know and that we would understand God. But creation has been laid out before. But what does creation do? Creation looks to the one that is greater than he. You look at a, a, a finely designed building, you want to know who the architect is, or maybe you want to know who the builder is. A piece of furniture. I remember when I was in my furniture building mode, there was a particular man, Sam Maloof. And I remember looking at one of the rockers that he had built and think, man, who did that? And I read up on him and how his techniques in these things because I was impressed with, with that which he has built. And now you see these are the two main attacks that the enemy brings up against uh, up against the Lord and the existence, the reality of the existence of Lord, of evolution and, and sowing discord within to the, the body of Christ and in the Word of God. Now, Job, in his ignorance, was complaining to God about his situation, as we are all prone to do. He didn't quite agree with what was going on in his life, although he was going through definitely a pretty hard time. I don't know if I would do any better than him. But the problem with him is, is he forgot who God was. He, he forgot the vastness of the, of the mind of God and the abilities of God. In, in chapter 38, verse 1, after Job was going through all of these things, matter of fact, Job even previously said, let me speak and you consider before you answer. It says, then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now prepare yourself like a man, and I will question you, and you shall answer me. That is a statement that is really delivered to all of mankind. All of mankind who is in opposition to God. Who is this who darkens my counsel? God has given his word, and it's the unbeliever through his unbelief that darkens the word, or darkens the counsel of God. And we do so, mankind, again, through our unbelief, not just a tax at it, directed at it, but just simply through unbelief and not receiving of it. Who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now, I have no idea the magnitude of it, but we have to be living in the time when there is more words out there than has ever been before. I was just talking to somebody, I was talking to Sean in my office, <clears throat> When we were growing up, we had channel 2, 4, 5, 7, 9, 11, and 13, so seven channels. And then there was maybe the bullfights on channel 56, and then Sesame Street on channel 28, something like that. And that was pretty much about it. Well, I'm still behind the times. I don't have the 300 channel cable, but I still do broadcast TV. But now you've got 2, 2.1, 2.2, 2.3, and so on and so forth. And so there's a ton of channels just on broadcast TV. And then you have the Internet. And then you have the blogs. And you have the Facebook. And I don't know if MySpace is still out there. And there's Snapchat. And there's uh, other things that I'm not even thinking of. And just all of these things. And then you've got text messages. I mean, my daughters and my wife, 
especially when they get in one of those group text message thing. My phone is going bing, 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 bing. Sounds like a slot machine that went out of control. But my point here is, is just look at all of the spewing of human wisdom and knowledge and really foolishness. Well, God says, who is that darkens counsel with words without knowledge? And for the majority of it, that's exactly what it is. Human intellect and the sight of God is nothing more than words without knowledge. And now he says, now prepare yourself like a man and I will question you and you shall answer me. Unfortunately, there's going to be quite a few people who do that, but it will be too late. It's called the great white throne judgment. Matter of fact, it says that's going to be a time when every mouth is stopped or nobody is going to be able to give an excuse for themselves before God. Because although we are all, in a way, people with words without knowledge, he brought the word with knowledge to us in Jesus Christ. And all who believed in him now will not perish, but have everlasting life. We're still people that are that are completely ignorant, foolish at times, sinful at other times, but now we've been covered by the grace of God. We have now been seen just as if we have never sinned. Now, when it comes to knowing God, many books have been written on the subject. I think J.I. Packard even wrote a book, Knowing God, an excellent book, no doubt about it, but the best a book can do is give an explanation about God. And again, some do a very good job, but the Bible surpasses all in that it does not seek to explain God, but all it seeks to do is to reveal God. And again, should have worked that way in your life when somebody shared the gospel with you, that God was revealed to you, and it opened up the reality of who He was or who He is. And it opened up His care and His concern. Again, Thursday night's teaching in John chapter 3, verse 16 the love that God has for all of mankind. And how, although maybe you were an outcast, and maybe even in your own mind you weren't so special, but you were special in the sight of God. How God was long-suffering for you, that God waited, and God was compassionate towards you, and giving all of those, that time in your unsaved state so that you would have time to get to that place of salvation. And in all of that, you see the goodness and the graciousness of God, and and it's simply because the Bible has revealed these things, or maybe I should say God has revealed these things through the Word of God, through the Bible. In John chapter 14, verse 9, in order to accentuate the Word, Jesus has said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show me the Father? And so there was the Word of God throughout the ages, but then there came that time when God accentuated or illuminated the Word by bringing Himself, presenting Himself to all of mankind. We read about it happening, but again, just, just think if you were there. It's again, as the Apostle John was there. I heard Him. I saw Him. I touched Him. I lived with Him. I walked with Him for three years. And He saw all that the Lord had done. And it was no doubt within his heart, because of who Christ was, because of that experience, he goes and he writes First John. Why? So that your joy may be full. So that you would not depend in the world or the wisdom of the world, but your trust would truly be in the living God. So since God's word had yet to be written in Job's day, God uses creation, what clearly reveals his attributes. It's in the light of creation that God invites Job to consider who he is, what he is able to do, and the control he has. Now, in chapter 38, after he tells Job to present himself as a man, in the next four chapters, God asks Job to consider three things that will leave everybody who reads it, especially Job, in awe of who God is. And matter of fact, these three things still hold water today. Matter of fact, they're very powerful today. Can you? You explain God's creation. With all of the wisdom that we have, man still cannot, in detail, explain creation. They've got theories, and most of their theories have some pretty big holes. But again, they cannot explain creation in detail apart from God. Okay, and you, if you take that one off the board, secondly, can you oversee God's creation? He asked Job that in 38, 39 through 39, 30. Can you oversee my creation? If I gave you the position, would you be able to conduct the weather as the weather needs to be conducted across the world? 
would you be able to oversee and care for the animals and care for the human race and, and all of these things? And if you want to take those two off the board, you can because in chapters 40 and 41, he asks, can you subdue creation? We're looking at El Nino. Now, a couple of weeks ago, there was a storm coming. As a matter of fact, I think there was two storms coming right on top of one another pretty much. And we were freaking out. I mean, they're, they're talking about the mudslides that are going to happen and these homes that are in danger. It's like, did you think it was ever going to rain again? But if you look at it as well, okay, if we're so smart, if we're so wise, how come we can't stop the rain? We can't. We can't start the rain. We can't stop the rain. We're in subjection to the one who is able to do those things. And so here he is. He's speaking to God in a very arrogant way, but he can't explain creation. He can't oversee creation, nor can he subdue creation. It's through creation that man is able to grasp the magnitude of the greatness of God. Then the second thing that the prophet Isaiah considers as he contemplates how great God is, is the nations, verses 15 through 17. Behold, the nations are as a drop in a bucket and are counted as the small dust on the scales. Look, he lifts up the isles as a very little thing, and Lebanon is not sufficient to burn. All the forests of Lebanon aren't sufficient to burn in his sight, nor its beasts sufficient for a burnt offering. All nations before him are as nothing, and they are counted by him less than nothing and worthless. In the shadow of the greatness of God, Let's just consider two nations here tonight. First one, the United States of America. In the United States of America, we're only 240 years old. 240 and a half, I think about, is what we are. Biblically speaking, the earth is some 6,000 years. If the earth is truly 6,000 years old and we're 240 year old, we're only a drop in the bucket. We're only a drop in the bucket. I mean, look how long Israel has been around and some of the other nations have been around United States and America is really nothing. Matter of fact, the Assyrian Empire, it lasted some 300 years. How many of us, apart from the Bible, ever even heard of Assyria, let alone an Assyrian Empire? You probably didn't know anything about it. I doubt if anybody knows any of the leaders or remembers any of the kings named Shenanakrib we had just talked about, but other than that, and you probably didn't remember that probably didn't do any better than me in pronouncing it but nonetheless it was just a it was just a blip along the timeline well again they were around 300 years even longer than we've been around up to now so as important as it was in its day it turns out that it was just a speck of dust on the timeline of world history and then we look at end time theology and we arrogantly think where's the united states of america maybe god just finger flicked us off the timeline because in his sight, we're nothing. How, how arrogant we are as we think that we have any kind of importance in the sight of God. How arrogant we must be if we believe that we have any integral part in the end time events. Now, God has blessed our nation, and I love our nation, but compared to the greatness of God, our nation is absolutely nothing. And the only thing that it is is because God has made it that way. Because at some point in history, we did seek after him, believe it or not. And so God, God is necessary in history. The United States of America has been invited in, and we've been allowed to stay up until now, but we are not necessary. Secondly, after the United States, consider Israel. Because if you're considering the greatness of God, you have to consider Israel because God has set his affections upon them, his chosen people, still even to this day. Although Israel does not seek after the Lord, he has chosen to reveal himself through the existence of Israel, or at least his care of Israel. That little nation that has not been a nation and then became a nation, it happened three times. God established it, Babylon came, and Assyria came in and destroyed it and took it in capture, but then it was reestablished. And then Rome came in and destroyed it. And then again in 1948, it was reestablished again. Show me any nation that that's happened. Show me any nation along the course of history that ceased to exist completely, was scattered to the winds, and then has been reestablished. God has done that with nation Israel so that we would know the greatness of God. So that you would look at Israel and you would say, wow, who's caring for those people? 
you know, the obvious that I talk about all the time, but all of these nations that surround it that hate it. I just read the Joel Rosenberg um, book, the latest Joel Rosenberg book. Uh, I think it's called The First Hostage. It's the second in a series. Highly recommend it. Now, it's fiction without a doubt, but it's really good reading, and it has along the lines of, of what I'm talking about here. But as many as attacks and threats that have been made by the world, God's promises continue to stand strong because he's greater than any opposition that Israel will ever face. Now, as I look at that and I see Israel still able to exist and not even just exist, but to thrive, how much more so? And, and I think that's why God does that, to show me how great he is and as he has placed his affection upon Israel, that Israel is able to, is able to prosper then I can look at my life as well, because God has set his affections upon me. God set his affections upon you as born-again believers. We are children of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And that being the case, God is able to keep me. God is able to, to, to come up against those who come up against me. And so, apart from the will of God, I'm immortal. There's going to be the day of my death. There's no doubt about that, but that date is chosen by God as well. In Zechariah chapter 2, verse 8, it says, For thus says the Lord of hosts, He sent me after glory to the nations which plunder you, for he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. I always thought that the apple of somebody's eye would be somebody that you look upon and you like looking upon them and they're a favored person. But really, the apple of somebody's eye is the pupil of their eye. That's considered to be the apple of the eye. And so the idea here is, is he who comes up against Israel, it's as if he's poking God in the eye. Have you ever had your eye poked? How painful that is? Well, can you imagine poking the eye of God? Well, if you look back at the course of history, all nations that have poked God in the eye by going after Israel, either are third world today or don't even exist today. And you see how God has kept his promises all. And what does it show me? It shows me that in the midst of the nations, God is great. God is great. Creation has displayed the greatness of God. The nations have displayed the greatness of God. And now he has considered, the prophet considers, but as he looks at God, God is greater than the idols. Verses 18 through 20. <clears throat> to whom then will you liken God or what likeness will you compare to him? The workman molds an image, the goldsmith overspreads it with gold, and the silversmith casts silver chains. Whoever is too impoverished for such contribution chooses a tree that will not rot. He seeks for himself a skillful workman to prepare a carved image that will not totter. Any god formed by man for whatever purpose will at some point teeter, or maybe totter, I don't know if it's a teeter or totter, says totter in the bible or yeah teeter and it will fall down it will let him down every time and what happens to you when your god falls you all go falling along with him you'll go down just as quickly as he goes down now case in point we are now actually we have entered the high holy days of the idol of our time it's the nfl playoffs time those who god's do well, they'll stand. But there's only going to be one team standing at the end. And everybody else whose idols have fallen, they're going to fall as well. Those gods who teeter and fall will take everybody down with them and they will fall into despair. I say that jokingly, but I say it seriously as well because it's true. Because they have put God to a lower level than a football game. Now, I watched a football game this afternoon, and I enjoyed the football game. I watched football yesterday as well. I don't have a problem. I was telling Sean, you guys, you got me that trip to Big Bear. You got it to, for me during the time of the Super Bowl. I'm going to be watching my first Super Bowl since 1999. But they haven't taken the place of God. I don't really care that much about it. And, but there's people there that that's their religion. Matter of fact, I heard a commentator say not too long ago that football has taken Sundays from the church. And unfortunately, it's arrogant saying that, but it's true. On that day, spousal abuse goes up, but not for the reason that you're thinking. Matter of fact, this is more along the lines of man's pride than man's despair. It doesn't come so much from the losers, but the winners. And that the winners, these men that watch these football games, all of a sudden feel entitled and empowered. 
And it's those men who abuse their spouses even more than the ones who lose. And so we are coming upon even that most holy of high days, the Super Bowl. And it's a day that has been completely given over to just this a game. It's a game. You think about that, looking at it from a third party? We pay people millions and millions of dollars to play a game. I was looking at golf. These guys, they pay these guys. The winner, the winner of the golf tournament today, he's going to get about $1.2 million because he won. And they're saying, yeah, you know, I'm playing this tournament, but I need to take some time off. And I need, I'm thinking, time off? I pay money to play golf every week because it's a game. It's fun. These people get paid millions of dollars. And somewhere along the line, things so got skewed. But what happens when your idol falls? Well, right now, you could ask the fans in St. Louis. They could write you a, a, a story as we unfortunately have taken repossession of the Rams. The Rams have had a losing record for the past, I think it's close to 20 years. Now all of a sudden, they're going to be a great team. <laughs> a false god is anything that replaces the worship of God. So yeah, you can enjoy golf, you can enjoy hobbies, you can enjoy football, or whatever it might be, but God's got to be the priority. If there's anything in your life that replaces or hinders a relationship with Jesus Christ, it has become an idol in your life. And there is going to come a time when that idol, as all idols do, it teeters and it falls, and great will be your fall. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 8-10, through 10, Paul spoke of this reality. It says, For from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Macedonia and Achaia would be Greece, but also in every place. Your faith towards God has gone out so that we do not need to say anything, for they themselves have concerning, um, declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Why? Because they understood the greatness of God. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. But they were, they, they understood at some point the inabilities of these idols to do anything for them, but also they realized the God who has done everything for them. And so I have to consider, have I allowed anything to enter into my life and to take the place of God? And maybe it could even be another person, whatever that might be. We just need to take inventory from time to time and consider these things. And then fourthly, he comes to the realization that God is greater than the rulers. Verses 21 through 24. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. He brings the princes to nothing. He makes the judges of the earth useless. Scarcely shall they be planted. Scarcely shall they be sown. Scarcely shall their stock take root in the earth when he will also blow on them and they will wither and the whirlwind will take them away like stubble. In case you haven't noticed, this is 2016, which is going to be an election year. We're looking for new leaders. We're looking for that great candidate that is going to change everything and make everything better. We're going to throw the old guy out. We're going to bring the new guy or woman in. But there's going to be a lot of hope placed in this person. That this person is going to do away with racial injustice. That this person is going to do away with economic failure. That this person is going to do away with social status. That this person... Well, it kind of reverts back a little bit back to the idol thing. That this person, they're expecting to take the place of God in their life. And the problem is, no matter who it is, it's the Donald or the Hillary or whoever it might be, everybody else in between, they're going to fail. They're going to fail expectations. See, the more aware I am of the Lord, the more I realize that there is not a person who can truly be a great ruler, especially apart from him. Just as God's desire for Israel, so must 
our desire be for him? As God has watched over and protected Israel, I need to come to him and I need to submit myself to him. The Lord must be our king. And so verse 24, it describes every human ruler who has ever existed or ever will exist. Scarcely shall they be planted. Scarcely shall they be sown scarcely shall their stock take root in the earth, so they're going to exist in office for a period of time, it says, then he will also blow on them, and they shall wither, and the whirlwind will take them away like stubble. They will be gone. They're there just for a period of time at the pleasure of the Lord for whatever his reasons may be. Proverbs 14, 34, righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. And then fifthly, <clears throat> Excuse me. God is greater than the stars. Verses 25 and 26. To whom then will you liken me, or to whom shall I be equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these things. Who brings out the host by number? That would be the stars of heaven. He calls them all by name, by the greatness of his might and by the strength of his power. Not one is missing. Who's hung the stars in the sky? God, and you look at the multitude of stars. You can't see them here, too much light, but you go up to the Sierras or wherever it might be, you just see layers upon layers upon, you see the depth and the magnitude and the multitude of the stars in existing, and God knows each one by name. He stuck each one exactly where it might be, and he upholds them by the power of his might. Now man has taken an improper perspective, and he worships the stars. Any newspaper that I've ever had or that I know of, you can open up and you can look up your horror scope. A horror scope, it means, or horror scope, it means time observer. And it's those people who are trying to observe the times apart from God. There's only one star to look to, and we, it's Revelation 22.16 speaks of it. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the church. I am the root of the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. And then last thing, last thing that's important, especially in our lives today, but I mean all of these things are without a doubt, God is greater than discouragement. Verse 27. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my just claim is passed over by my God. Have you not known, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, never faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak, and to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youths, even the strong young men is what he's speaking of, even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary, they shall walk and not faint. I look at that section of Scripture, and I'm thinking, I should have kind of cut that out and hold it till next week and do a whole study on that. But then God kind of speaks to me and says, sometimes as a pastor, you add words to my words, and it takes away or subtracts from what's there. That Scripture, that section of Scripture, that stands alone. That stands alone. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength, they shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Father, we just thank you, Lord, that not only are you great, but you have revealed your greatness to us. And I pray, Father, that we would be receptive of it, that we would be knowledgeable of it, that we would meditate upon it, that we would understand that great God who has worked and done such an amazing thing all the way up until this moment is the same God that works and even exists in our future. And so, Father, I pray for those who are here tonight that you would bless them and that you would keep them, that you would give them a surety, Father, that we are not to be discouraged because it's you who holds our future. Matter of fact, we have a great hope in store for us. And because of that, Father, I pray that we would be faithful and dedicated even today. And so, Lord, each of us can meditate upon you. We can look back at our problems or situations and circumstances and see, Lord, how you have emerged victorious in the midst of all. For that, Father, we thank you, and we just glorify you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You all stand, please.